in this class, I would like to take the opportunity to speak about theology of liberation. It's a movement, it's been a movement in the Latin American church based on the theme of liberation. That is, it sees God's love uh, in history, especially God's love for the poor, the, the outcast, the oppressed, as taking the form of liberation for them, or liberation with them. That people need to be free, people are not made, we are not created by God to be slaves of any, of any system in which we may exist. And so this is the notion that God is really calling us to be free, but not to be free in a selfish way, not in a self-centered way, as we have in much of our capitalist uh, business-oriented economy here, just the freedom to do whatever I want without any concern for the common good, without any concern for the harm that, I, that my business may be doing to society, polluting the atmosphere, polluting the rivers, and so forth. Not that kind of freedom. It's not a selfish kind of freedom. It's a freedom to be a true human being and a true brother and sister of others. So uh, the freedom to love. But first of all, we have to stop being slaves. Everybody should have this kind of freedom with which to decide what he or she wants to do with his life. So this is the movement called the Theology of Liberation. And Eocoria, Father Eocoria, the president, was one of the leading authors. He was one of the leading theologians in this type of theology. Uh, and I think we can see that that kind of thinking really got him killed. You know, it was because his faith was <coughs> a faith in a God, Christ, essentially, the uh, Son of God, made man, Christ, calling us to be free, calling people to be free, and calling us to be social pro prophets, social critics, uh, and paying the consequences uh, often. So a few of the theologians, the well-known theologians of liberation, if you want to do any research on, on this, would be Gustavo Gutierrez, a Peruvian priest. In 1970, he started writing down some of this kind of theology. It had been really kind of bubbling up uh, from the people themselves, through the people's own reflections on scripture. Uh, people asking, what is Jesus calling me to do? Uh, why was Jesus put to death? What is he calling us to do? How can we be other Christs in the world? People were reflecting on scripture in that way. Seeing Jesus as a human Jesus, not denying his divinity, but seeing Jesus as, as very human. Uh, he, he got angry, he got frustrated, he suffered all the things that we all suffer, and he, wanted, he spoke out very clearly against the hypocrisy in the temple and the injustices, the exploitation being committed by the leaders of the temple, the, le the leaders of Jerusalem. So Gustavo Gutierrez, a book called A Theology of Liberation. It's a little bit dense, it's not necessarily the one to start with. Uh, he has other writings that are a little more popular, as we say, a little more uh, of the people. Leonardo Boff uh, and Jon Sobrino, he was a member of this community. He lived in this house, another leading theologian of liberation. He was in Thailand giving a seminar on liberation theology when this massacre was carried out against his brothers and his sisters who had, been, who had stayed in the little, little house uh, down the way. Uh, Jon Sobrino is a noted author of the theology of liberation. Um, and he has dedicated his work, his professional work as a theologian, to maintaining the, uh, keeping them alive in a certain sense, keeping alive the testimony of his brothers who were killed. So I would recommend uh, Jon Sobrino also for your uh, research into this topic. Now, some people feel that this issue of liberation is not really accepted in the church. There has been controversy over it because some bishops, uh, some priests, some lay people who are very wealthy, people who are big landowners, they don't like this idea of emphasizing the gospel of Jesus as a call to liberation. Because if you're a landowner or if you're a slave owner, or if you're a, a factory owner or a, a landowner who is exploiting the people, 
Well, they don't want the people to start thinking this way. They don't want common people, poor people, peasants, and so forth, who may not even be literate, they don't want them thinking that they are somebody, you know, that they, they have dignity, that they should not be treated as slaves or as things. And so there's been a real, a real contra controversy naturally about this theme of liberation, just as there was controversy about Jesus. You know, Jesus was put to death uh, because he was with the poor, because he was speaking out against the powers that be in the temple in Jerusalem. And he was accusing them of being hypocrites and accusing them of being uh, exploiters of the poor. And so it's, but it is something that has been uh, really accepted in the church. This is a statement by the bishops who met in Rome in 1971. Action on behalf of justice and participation in the transformation of the world fully appear to us as a constitutive dimension. That is an essential <clears throat> dimension of the preaching of the gospel. The gospel means basically good news, good news to the poor. Well, if we're going to proclaim and bring the good news of God's love to people who are poor, who are oppressed, who are struggling in various ways, it has to be in real life. It has to represent some, the possibility of some real change for them, change in their lives. That if they come together and form communities, get to know one another, discuss their problems, they can work <clears throat> together to solve their problems and have a better future. So work for justice, action on behalf of justice, uh, is a constitutive or essential dimension of the gospel, or in other words, of the church's mission for the redemption of the human race and its liberation from every oppressive situation. This was an official statement of the Roman Catholic Church. And the martyrs of El Salvador, many of them who, in addition to the Jesuits, many people were martyred in El Salvador, this is what they believed. And they believe that if we're really proclaiming the gospel of Jesus as good news to the poor, which Jesus himself had said, uh, then we need to be with the poor, we need to be on the side of the poor, on the side of the oppressed, and uh, struggling for change. Again, just to, now, just to focus a bit on Ea Correa, Father Ea Correa, as I said, he was the president of the university in San Salvador, a noted philosopher and theologian, and he was promoting a negotiated settlement of the Revolutionary War. There was a revolution going on in El Salvador all during the 80s. They were killed practically at the end of the 80s. Um, and he was promoting a negotiated settlement of that revolutionary conflict. But that did not sit well with the military, with the upper classes, because they wanted to wipe out the revolutionaries. They didn't want to negotiate with the revolutionaries. There's a picture of Father Rey Correa. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or for justice, for they will be satisfied. So Jesus is, is urging us, in a way, to be involved in work for justice, in the struggle for a more decent and more just society. This is the, uh, one of the books of Father Rey Correa. Uh, you can see the, the theme of freedom, and yet uh, Jesus being crucified because he was a prophet, because he was speaking out against injustice and hypocrisy. Eucharia spoke of salvation in history, the salvation of history. That salvation is not something that just happens above history or alongside history or in our heads or in our hearts. It happens in history. That is, it has to do with change in the world. People can believe in the possibilities of salvation, of liberation, if they see that working together, they can really work for change. And this is important too, this aspect that the Christian does not live in a different world. We're all in the same world, and we're all facing the same problems, unemployment, exploitation of workers, um, the, damage to the, the damage to our environment, the oppression of one country over another, or of one class over another, and uh, we need to work for change in this world. We are citizens of one world in which the kingdom of God has appeared in an historical way. The kingdom of God, this is a key theme also in liberation theology. The, kingdom, the world as God wants it to be. A world of justice, of peace, of brotherhood and sisterhood, 
where we care for one another and respect one another, form community, and uh, work for a better future. Now, this is a very important statement that Ayakuria made. It shows what he thought of at, was the role of the university. What is a university for? For some people, a university is just to study, study the truth, to find uh, truth and knowledge and so forth, almost for its own sake. But for Ayakuria, and I would say for many of our Jesuit universities, especially in recent times, the, the aim, the purpose of a theological fact of faculty or of a university should be to be a critical and creative consciousness, critical, that is in the university through sociology, through political science, through economics, all the social sciences, and uh, the liberal arts as well, uh, we should be able to understand the world. What is the reality that we're dealing with in our world? and to understand the injustices and the mechanisms of injustice. How is it that so many people are suffering in the world, and, and seemingly more and more, that people in Nicaragua, for instance, uh, peasants, farm workers, are making $100 a month. People, uh, teachers and nurses, uh, making about between $200 and $250 a month. All of these injustices, a university should be able to analyze what's going on, and really bring out the reality of society. What, it, how does society work? Who is exploiting whom? Who's in charge? Who's giving the orders? Who benefits? Whose interests are being served? And so that's how Ea Korea saw the university. And a, a creative consciousness at work in the service of the community. For him, the, the university, which was his mission, his apostolate, as a priest, as a Jesuit, was to be at the service of the community. For him, it was an expression of, of love of the people, but as a university. That is, it needed to be competent, it needed to know what it was doing, it needed to be excellent, academically excellent, but not just in itself or for its own sake, but academically excellent as an instrument for social change and economic change and political change. And uh, to form young people to be people for others. This is uh, kind of a motto of our Jesuit universities, that what do we hope to contribute to the development of the young people in our universities? That they become people for others. People who care about others, people who are generous with their talents, with their capabilities, people who will dedicate themselves to making a, a better world. But as you can see, with that kind of an idea of what the university was about, uh, they fell into great disfavor among the upper classes, the ruling classes, and the military of El Salvador. So they paid the price for their courage and for being prophets. Just as in this country, Martin Luther King, uh, other people, many others who were involved in the civil rights movement, People involved in the farm workers movement, peace movement, have paid the price. And many Christians have uh, given their lives for the gospel in the sense of the gospel as good news to the poor. The gospel in the sense of uh, a challenge to the injustices of society. So at, at the funeral procession, at the funeral, there was a huge throng of people expressing their admiration and their support for the Jesuits and the two women who had been killed.